well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Technical Assistance Grants Informational Meeting. I'm Nancy Fitzpatrick, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Peggy Shaw. Um, Peggy and I both work in MassDEP's Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup in the Policy and Program Development Group. And together we manage and help facilitate the TAG program. The purpose of this meeting and presentation this evening is to provide a general overview of the program and to answer any questions that you may have regarding it. Okay, uh, next slide please, thank you. Um, before we proceed, I'd just like to go through a few logistical matters. Um, first, during the course of the presentation, all participants will be muted except for Peggy and myself. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function to enter them, and we will do our best to answer them before the close of the evening. Um, there will be a lot of time at the end of the presentation for any additional questions and answers as well. Um, we'd like you to be aware that this is being recorded and will be posted on the MassDEP tag webpage short shortly, um, along with the full PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Peggy to get us started. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nancy. And thank you all for joining us um, for this presentation on the upcoming funding opportunity available to the Technical Assistance Grant Program. Um, so um, we'll start out by providing some background information and um, the mission of the TAG program. We will go over eligibility requirements, who can apply, where funding may be used, what type of projects and activities um, the grant funding can be used for. We will um, then cover um, procedures and other logistics associated with the application and award process. And um, as we've already mentioned, there'll be time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions. What we won't be discussing are details about the cleanup work that's being that's taking taking place at any particular hazardous waste site. Um, and I also want to um, emphasize that this um, is an overview of the TAG program. And as Nancy already did, I will also encourage you to visit our TAG webpage for more detailed information. Um, the link is here, but I also provided the, I just provided the link in the chat. Um, next slide, please. So um, the technical assistance grants are administered by MassDEP's Wayside Cleanup Program. As you may know, the Wayside Cleanup Program is responsible for ensuring timely assessment and cleanup of hazardous waste disposal sites in Massachusetts. And the procedures on how to perform these cleanups are provided in our regulations titled the Massachusetts Contingency Plan or um, the MCP. So when you hear us refer to the MCP throughout this presentation, what we're referring to are the regulations that govern the cleanup of hazardous waste disposal sites in Massachusetts. An essential component of the site cleanup process is public involvement. And the MCP outlines um, requirements for public notifications of activities and um, cleanup work that's being conducted at disposal sites. However, many people um, find it difficult to understand the technical information contained in the plans and reports related to the assessment and cleanup of sites. So in addition to public notification requirements, the MCP also includes specific, specific opportunities for, for the public to become more involved in the decision-making process of a disposal site cleanup. So we are here um, today to discuss one of those mechanisms, the technical assistance grants. Um, so the, the purpose of grants is to support effective public involvement by providing funding to assist groups in obtaining expert technical assistance to understand and evaluate disposal site activities and enhance public education and public access to information. And just to be clear, um, I wanna emphasize that TAG funding is not intended to be used to fund actual cleanup and assessment work at a disposal site. It's limited to these um, public involvement related activities. Uh, next slide, please. So just um, a quick history of the TAG program. Um, TAGs were introduced um, 
with um, the enhanced public involvement procedures that were part of the wayside cleanup redesign in 1993. The first tags were awarded in 1995, and we offered funding rounds for most year, years between um, 1995 and 2002. In 2002, the TAG program took a, 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 a break, I guess. Um, one reason was um, due to the additional changes, um, due to additional changes being made to the Wayside Cleanup program, including the TAG procedures. We picked up TAGs again and offered funding rounds in 2007 through 2010. Um, and then um, TAGs have been on hold, were on hold from, um, after 2010, this is primarily a reflection of limited resources, of limitations on resources, both um, staff resources and funding that could be earmarked for this purpose. We were able to bring tags back last year, and for the fiscal year 2022, we funded three tag awards. Next slide, please. So for this funding round, the total available funding is anticipated to be $200,000 with individual awards of up to 20,000 per applicant group. And um, just to clear, just to be clear, um, grants are available for up to $20,000, but maybe you may apply for one um, for less than 20,000, or you may be awarded one less than 20,000, you just can't. You just won't receive one for over 20,000. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so now we'll get into um, the eligibility requirements for TAGS. Um, and um, I wanna emphasize as we start to discuss the specific requirements or procedures related to TAGS, these rules are defined in the TAG provisions of our regulations, the MCP. Um, and again, this is an overview of the requirements and um, I'll encourage you again to um, check out our, our the tag webpage, which will um, provide which provides more detailed information. So um, there are specific groups who are eligible to apply for tags. First, groups of individuals um, such as community groups and neighborhood associations. And um, in parentheses, we note that this includes existing PIP groups. Um, just a quick explanation um, about what PIP groups are um, for those who are not um, familiar with with public involvement um, plan sites. Another way that the MCP provides an opportunity for the public to be involved in the cleanup of a disposal site is through um, a designation of that site as a public involvement plan site or a PIP site. How this works is a group of 10 or more citizens in the community petition to have the disposal site designated as a PIP site. Um, once designated, the person who is conducting response actions at that site must develop a PIP plan. Um, a PIP plan basically is an agreement between them and the public about how they will convey information about what is going on at that site with the public and how the public can comment on activities that are going on at that site. <clears throat> a group that's already established as a PIP group um, is, are generally, um, these groups are generally um, good candidates um, for this type of funding. But um, I also wanna emphasize that um, a community group or neighborhood group does not need to be a PIP group to apply um, and be eligible for a TAG. Um, certain public entities are also eligible for a TAG, um, including municipalities, public water and public water districts. Um, and, um, I also wanted to um, also wanted to note that one of the eligibility criteria imposed by our regulations is the requirement that um, the recipients of tags be affected by. Um, sorry, I lost my place in my notes here. Um, <laughs> the um, recipients of tags must be affected by oil and or hazardous materials from an eligible disposal site. And um, I apologize, this is, is not um, correct in the slide. Um, that's the result of making changes at the last minute, <laughs> the same day as the presentation. What it should be is affected by oil and or hazardous material from eligible disposal, um, any eligible disposal site. Um, this is interpreted fairly liberally, but um, the applicant needs to show some nexus to the site. Um, so for example, you know, municipality applying for a tag for disposal site in that town um, 
that would meet the eligibility requirement that they're affected by the disposal site. A community group on the North Shore that's interested in what's going on on a site in Barnstable, um, be a little harder to show a nexus there. Next slide, please. So the primary reason for ineligibility is when um, the group or a member of the group um, is responsible in some way for the cleanup at the disposal site. So if um, they are an owner or operator of the disposal site or are otherwise responsible for conducting or funding assessment or cleanup work at the site, they're not eligible to apply. Um, so an example would be if, the dis if a disposal site is located on a parcel that's owned by a municipality, that municipality is not eligible to apply for a tag for that particular disposal site. There's other more specific examples about ineligibility, and um, you can take a look at the tag webpage for those details. Next slide, please. So um, which disposal sites are eligible? I think um, hopefully it goes without saying that the disposal site must be located in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, but wanted to mention that. <laughs> um, the MCP defines three categories of disposal sites that are eligible for a tag. And um, the rationale for limiting to these categories is that the cleanup work at the disposal site should be at a certain point um, in order to qualify for a tag. So we're looking at sites where a certain level of assessment um, and data collection has taken place already. So um, first um, bullet, the, a site that has been um, tier classified is either tier one or tier two. Um, a brief explanation of what that means for those not familiar with our program. Disposal sites that are managed under the Waste Site Cleanup Program in MCP must tier classify within one year after coming into our system. A simple spill that can be cleaned up quickly, um, less than one year, would not be required to tier classify. So when we're talking about tier classified sites, we're referring to more complex sites that have been in our system longer. Also eligible um, are sites that um, our program considers to be adequately regulated, meaning that the response actions being, uh, are being conducted under another regulatory program. This includes federal um, Superfund sites that are on EPA's national priorities list and um, also sites being managed under another state-run program, um, such as the RECRA Hazardous Waste Program or um, Solid Waste Program. Um, a specific scenario I wanna mention, so this has come up a couple of times recently um, and it's a bit of a hot topic. We've been asked whether a tag can be used to help communities where homeowners have concerns about PFAS levels detected in their well water. Um, it really depends, the answer to this really depends on whether a disposal site has been identified as the source and if the disposal site falls into one of the three categories listed on the slide. Um, it's been tier classified or it's considered adequately regulated. Um, many of these homeowner cases about PFAS, um, involving PFAS of private drinking wells, um, DEP has been notified of. They may be in our system and been assigned a site number, but have not been tier classified. And the source of the contamination, um, um, you know, the, the contamination hasn't been linked to a source um, that's a tier classified disposal site. So in that scenario, um, they would not be eligible to apply for a tag. Um, I didn't do a separate slide for ineligible sites, but um, disposal sites, um, just one dimension, um, disposal sites that have been cleaned up, uh, meaning a permanent solution has been achieved, are not eligible for a tag. Next slide, please. Um, so while on the topic of eligible disposal sites, it's a good time to mention our online, online sites database um, as some of you are, are already aware, the Wayside Cleanup Program maintains its disposal site files in an online database that's accessible to the public. For those of you um, who are not familiar with this webpage, we wanted to highlight how the site's database can be useful in obtaining information about a site in your community. And if you decide to apply for a tag, the information available here would be uh, very helpful in completing the grant application. Um, so if you um, click on the link in the slide, um, it'll open the page 
um, that's displayed in the screenshot that's on the other side of the slide. Um, so first, I want to direct you to um, the heading, what you need to know. Um, and under that heading, you can find some instructional videos on how to navigate, navigate the site um, that you might find useful. So to open up the database, you look under the heading, what, um, what would you like to do? Next slide, please. So from here, you, um, you click on the um, waste sites and reportable releases slash spills lookup. Next slide, please. And it brings you to this form. Um, a convenient feature of this form is you only need to fill in one field um, to pull up information. So if you're looking for information about all the disposal sites in your town, um, you just enter the, na the, uh, the name of your town in the city slash town field, hit search, and it will bring up a list of all the disposal sites for your town um, that we have in our database. And from there, you can click on each individual disposal site and you'll be able to access links to um, the documents that have been submitted to DEP um, for that disposal site that we have available in the database. Um, if you have a particular disposal site in mind, you can fill in both the address in the town and it will bring up information um, for that site. And um, with that, I will turn it back over to Nancy. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Um, now, it's uh, important to understand how TAG funds may be used, or in other words, what types of activities are eligible for TAG fund funding. Here we provide some general examples. They include hiring experts such as a licensed site professional, an environmental consultant, an attorney, or other technical experts such as a risk assessor or a translator, for instance to advise those communities affected by a particular disposal site. Now, for those who may be unfamiliar with the term licensed site professional, LSPs are environmental professionals who are licensed in Massachusetts to oversee disposal site assessment and cleanup under the Chapter 21E law and the rules and regulations of the MCP. TAG funds may also be used to support public outreach activities that inform and educate an affected community. Next slide, please. Okay. More specific examples of TAG projects include enlisting an LSP to review, interpret, and explain regulatory reports to help a community better understand site conditions and response actions that may be ongoing hiring a risk assessor to evaluate a risk characterization report that will be used to guide future cleanup decisions, and supporting community forums, websites, and public meetings to encourage public participation. Okay, um, as Peggy has mentioned a couple times before, um, for further information and clarification of the TAG eligibility requirements, we do strongly recommend that you consult um, the TAG webpage. And once the grant opportunity has been released, there's a lot of detail in that document as well. Um, moving on now to our next slide. Um, before we get into the specifics of the um, application itself, We'd like to provide you with an estimated timeline for the grant procurement process. Um, as you see, the first item here is this evening's meeting, um, the informational meeting, June 14th. The next important date to be aware of, and again, these are estimated timelines. They could change. If they do change, we would certainly alert you, um, most likely on our webpage and possibly via email. Um, but the next important date to be aware of is Friday, July 15th. And that's the date that the notice of the grant opportunity will be posted on Combi's and the MassDEP website. And in addition, the tag opportunity and the grant application itself will also be posted on the MassDEP tag website. Um, I would like to add a comment that between now and July 15th, if you have questions regarding the TAG process or potential projects, you can contact 
Peggy or myself and either by email or telephone and we can have a discussion. But as soon as these documents are posted on the web page, the, the application, the grant opportunity, and the notice of the grant opportunity via combis in the Mass DEP website, all inquiries have to be submitted in writing via email. Um, I think Peggy will speak to that a little bit later in the presentation for clarification purposes. Um, so following uh, the question and answer period, Mass DEP, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the question and answer period will end on Tuesday, August 30th at 5 p.m. So any written questions via email need to be submitted by that time. The official answers will be posted on the Mass DEP webpage by Tuesday, September 13th. Um, the grant application deadline will be Tuesday, October 18th, 5 p.m. And the estimated announcement of grant, grant awards will be Tuesday, January 31st of 2023, with an estimated contract start day of Tuesday, April 4th, 2020, 2023. Sorry. I would like to add that for those who aren't familiar with Combis, Combis is the state's online procurement platform for these types of announcements. Okay. Uh, moving on. So the tag application itself is a fillable Word document. It is to be completed electronically and submitted via an email by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 18th. The application requires information on the applicant and the subject disposal site and contains eight evaluation criteria that need to be addressed. Next slide, please. Once the applications have been submitted, uh, the TAG application review process consists of a review of the eligibility cr criteria for the applicant, the subject disposal site, and the activities in the proposed projects. Rules for eligibility were discussed early in this presentation. A grant review team consisting of Mass DEP staff reviews and scores each application individually based on the eight evaluation criteria set forth in the application. The projects that will be awarded funding are, are those that best address the TAG program goals. Next slide. Now moving on to the application criteria itself. Uh, criteria A, severity and complexity of a disposal site. This criteria seeks information such as the site size, its location and setting. For example, is it in a residential neighborhood or is it more in industrial by nature? The type and level of contaminants, the extent of contamination in various media, whether it be in soil, groundwater, sediments, indoor air, specific exposure pathways of concerns, the MCP status, whether it be tier classified, adequately regulated or perhaps a NAPL site. Um, we're looking for information on uh, how the site um, poses any impacts on health, safety, public wel welfare, and, and the environment. Criterion B, the connection to the waste site cleanup program go goals. This speaks to how a subject site would impact health, safety, public welfare, and the environment, and how the activities in the proposed project would aid the affected com community in that regard. Criterion C, promoting public awareness. What type of activities and strategies are incorporated in the proposed project that would increase public involvement provide opportunities for interactive community involvement, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Criterion D, outreach capability. We would be looking for whether affected communities have been identified 
and does the applicant provide examples of other projects that demonstrate their ability to communicate with and engage that affected community. Um, examples are always um, great, great to have, particularly if they're projects that were very that were similar in nature. Um, criterion E, the implementation potential. Um, we'd be looking for prior experiences, successes that an applicant can demonstrate as an organized group, um, whether they have dedicated office staff um, and administrative staff that's capable to, to help move the project forward and tr track deadlines, track funding. Does the project description, the budget, the schedule, demonstrate the, their capability to effectively manage the proposed project. Criterion F, budget and timeline. Is the timeline feasible for completion by June 30th, 2024? Does it include detailed incredible cost estimates for proposed activities um, and and salaries for hired experts and, and deliverables, such as any report that might be generated. Next slide, please. Criterion G, benefits and environmental justice community. Is the disposal site located in an environ environmental justice com community? And if so, how will the project benefit it? MassDP is very committed to advancing equity, diversity, and environmental justice through all its key agency activities. So any details regarding the beneficial aspects of the proposed project on that environmental justice community um, would be sig significant. Um, our last criterion H, um, benefits and economic target area. Again, is the site located in an economic target area? The best source of information we have found for this is contacting the local municipality to find out um, if, the, if this criterion would, would apply. Um, and if so, a description of how the project would benefit the uh, area economically. Um, let me see, I think that's about it there. Okay, next slide. So in reviewing and scoring the evaluation criteria, the grant review team will be looking for details and specificity in project proposals. Um, proposals or should demonstrate a clear focus and convey the applicant's ability to manage the project, track the funding and achieve the project goals. Um, they clearly need to demonstrate that they have the ability to, to move the project forward. Next slide, please. So some examples of some rec relatively recent TAG proposals. Um, these projects were uh, successful and granted TAGs because they all were quite focused um, and they're quite interesting, I thought. Um, one project funded translation services for um, a multilingual neighborhood. So I believe uh, MCP reports were translated into Portuguese and Spanish in, in the community. Again, to convey information, to educate the public, to help um, aid the community in understanding exactly what was going on in their community and how it may have affect them. Another project funded some risk assessment experts to review existing data sets, um, quite, uh, quite an extensive data set, and provide an evaluation of the risk characters, risk characterization, excuse me, um, perhaps point out some gaps in the inv investigation or identify some exposure concerns. A third project funded LSP services to review disposal site assessment in, a, in phase one after a site had been tier classified and in the system a bit, investigating the extent a, of, a, of a groundwater plume um, within a community. 
Um, next slide, please. So in wrapping up my section here, um, again, some reminders on the TAG application process. Um, all application materials will be available to download from the TAG webpage on Friday, July 12th, uh, July 15th, 2022. Again, that is an estimated tentative date. If that should change, we would certainly notify you. And applications and all supporting documents uh, must be submitted electronically by 5 p.m. Tuesday, October 18th. Again, tentative, subject to change, but hopefully not, to um, my email address. And you see that there. Okay. Next slide. And with that, I think Peggy's going to take over. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, so um, we wanted to just provide um, a, a little bit of information um, about the award pr procedures um, if you do decide to apply for a TAG. Um, one, only one TAG award, um, only one tag will be awarded per applicant group, and only one um, one tag will um, can be awarded per disposal site. But one award may be used for more than one disposal site. So um, a scenario where this might be useful is when um, there are two disposal sites located on a single property. It might make sense for a group to apply for. Um, and be awarded funding um, for tag related activities at both of these disposal sites. A question that came up during the last funding round was can two separate groups apply for tag for one disposal site? Um, so there's nothing prohibiting two groups from collaborating, um, but uh, we can only contract with and disperse funds um, to one group. So um, those two groups, they can collaborate, but they need to decide um, who the point of contact would be. And that group um, whose point of contact would be the one that would apply um, for the tag. Um, we also want to talk, um, I want to talk a little bit about the duration of the funding award. Um, as Nancy just noted, um, the estimated date for the contracts um, to be es es executed and work to begin um, is next April, 2023. Um, these contracts will run through the end of the next fiscal year, which is, um, so they will end on June 30th, 2024. Um, so these contracts um, will be running longer than one year if needed. Um, this is a different approach than what we've done in the past with tags. Um, we've typically had tags running for just one fiscal year, um, but we hope by allowing more time, um, for, um, for the TAG recipients um, to, um, to complete their projects and alleviate the need for, um, for um, contract extensions. Um, I also wanna emphasize, um, as Nancy also um, emphasized that um, these, these dates are estimated and the contract start date is very estimated. Um, TAGs are subject to the same procurement procedures as um, all of the state funded grants and these processes can take time to get through um, and DEP doesn't have control over all um, phases of that process. We will um, do our best to move this forward as, uh, you know, move it forward as quickly, move these forward as quickly as possible, but, um, uh, you know, some of this is out of our control. Um, this is kind of um, the the, um, the April 2024 is is a conservative date. So um, I'm optimistic that you know we can meet that and do better, but um, we can't promise anything. Um, so um, that being said, that's that's an estimated date, but the contract end date remains the same regardless of when the contracts start. Um, and um, just want to note that there may be opportunities for contracts to be extended into the next fiscal year um, if extensions are needed. And that's at the discretion of NASDAQ. Next slide, please. Um, so if chosen for TAG award, uh, these are the required documents that will need to be completed. Um, first and uh, most importantly, um, um, the, um, the Commonwealth standard 
um, contract. Um, this is required for all grants and um, any any contracts with the state. Um, you need, this needs to be completed. Um, it's the same the same form that's used for any state contract, and it's available on the state controls webpage. Um, Second, um, the scope of services agreement is an addendum to the standard contract. And this is an agreement between the grant recipient and um, DEP describing the tag specific requirements. Um, the scope also includes um, the proposed itemized budget and proposed timelines um, for, um, for the various tasks of the project. The rest of these forms listed here um, are the other state contract and related forms. Um, that'll need to be completed either at the time the contract is signed or before um, dispersing um, funds can be done. Um, these are all available on the comptroller's webpage um, and um, links to these forms will be included in the, um, the grant opportunity. Um, so you'll be able to um, access that once the opportunity is published. Next slide, please. So um, the TAG grant, um, the TAG award uh, works as uh, works on a reimbursement basis. So in other words, if you're chosen for a grant, you won't receive the award in a lump sum. Um, rather, your the funding will be distributed to you as you incur costs. Um, and this is for expenses that are incurred after the contract between the award recipient and MassDEP has been signed. So only expenses that are incurred during um, the duration of the contract will be eligible for reimbursement. Um, the next two bullets are, <coughs> excuse me, um, the next two bullets are just kind of an FYI for groups um, who are just beginning to organize themselves. Um, groups receiving rewards must have legal authority to receive, disperse, and manage um, the award funds. Um, this requires being recognized by the Massachusetts Secretary of State. And for your convenience, we have included a link in the slide to the Secretary of, uh, of State's webpage where you can find information about how to go about applying for the status um, if you um, need to do that. The process does not have to be completed before you apply for a tag, but our regulations do require that this status be in place at the time the funding is awarded. Um, also, in order be, to receive TAG funds, the group must have a taxpayer ID number. Um, information and instructions on how to obtain this number are, are available on the IRS webpage. Um, and again, um, this is not required before applying for a TAG, um, but this number, the taxpayer ID number, will be necessary in order to request reimbursement for exp expenses if. Um, a grant is awarded. Next slide, please. Um, so um, Nancy already referenced um, the official Q&A period um, and um, just wanted to emphasize um, um, about um, communication during the application process. Um, so th the grant opportunity um, and application is scheduled to be made available on July 15th. Um, tentatively. Until then, uh, we can speak with you directly about the process, about potential projects that you may be considering. Um, so, you know, I, I'll call this the, you know, informal Q&A process um, period. Um, once the application goes live on, you know, July 15th or around that time, um, the more formal Q&A period begins. And um, per procurement rules, um, Communication is very limited. Um, questions need to be submitted to us in writing, and um, we will answer those questions in a formal um, Q and A document. Um, uh, you know, an official answer document that would be posted on our webpage uh, by September, tentatively September thirteenth. Um, and um, I also wanted to note that in this funding round, uh, we have to twelve hour more time between this meeting tonight and the date that the opportunity and the application are posted. So this allows more time um, for interested, um, you know, potential applicants to contact us directly during this uh, more informal Q&A time with any specific questions you may have. Um, next slide, please. 
So we're at the end of the prepared presentation and um, we can now answer any questions that you may have. Um, and if this, um, if you, if um, there's any other questions that you think of after um, tonight, um, feel free to reach out to either of us. Our contact information is here. Email us, call us. We're happy to talk tags with you. <laughs> Peggy, I'm just looking at the chat and since you're you're on the topics here that one of the questions was um, just for the benefit of the group must a group have a 501 C3 designation to be eligible. And I believe and you just answered that but um, They so, must have a legal tax ID number in order to request reimbursement if a grant is awarded. In order to apply for a tag grant, you don't need that number right then, but you need to eventually get it um, in accordance with Peggy's instructions through the Secretary of State. Correct, Peggy? Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that the, the status that you receive from the Secretary of State does not have to be a nonprofit or um, you just need to have a status as recognized by the Secretary of State. So you can be a for-profit company and apply for a tax. You just have to be recognized by the Secretary of State. It's typically nonprofit companies who, uh, nonprofit groups, community groups who, who uh, would be interested. Uh, but the regs do not preclude other, um, you know, entities from, um, from applying for a grant. Okay. This is another good question. Um, can you be awarded each year or just once overall? Um, you can apply. Um, yeah, you can apply in different funding rounds. You can just be um, receiving one award per applicant is per funding round. Right. So um, the next funding round, you can apply for a grant again. But I believe you have to have completed your project that was funded. Um, I don't think so. Okay, we might have to we, look we, into let's that. Clear, we can clarify that question. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, I think there's one more here in the chat. For community groups, what does authorized signatory mean? Um, yeah, that's that. just, we have the, um, the, the form, um, the signatory form, it just identifies who's going to sign the contract and, um, and, and, you know, be the, um, be the official point of contact for us, um, that who's doing business with us, but it's, it's, it's in general, it's the person who's signing the documents. Right. Invoices, what have you. Yeah. Signing the invoices. Submitted. Yeah, that's, and that's anyone, what I was looking for. Yeah. And every, anyone who signs the contract or signs an invoice has to be listed on that authorized signatory form, which right. also needs to be notari notarized. Right, correct. Um, and it can be more than one person listed on that form. So you can have one person signing the contract, one person signing the invoice, but both of those individuals will need to be listed on that form. Liz, someone asked if you could show the timeline slide again. Is that possible to pull that up? Sure. I think it's, it's the blue slide. <laughs> I'll just run all the way back, if that's okay. Try not to get dizzy. There we go. Yeah. Oh, I see a hand up, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Kelly Matthews. I'm treasurer of Alewife Neighbors Incorporated, which is in Cambridge. And we uh, were formed back in the 1990s, actually, and had a tag in the late 1990s uh, because we are adjacent to the GCP or Grace Construction product site. So a question from our vice president who wasn't able to be here tonight is um, our current status is that is URAM on the website that you showed earlier. So we have an open RAM plan 
Um, we were previously a tier classified site that was closed with an AUL, but we have an open RAM plan for work that is intended to be started in the next few months. Do we qualify? Are we eligible to apply for this tag opportunity? Yes, so the, um, the, 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 the criteria in the MCP is very specific about um, what type of sites are qualified and it does need, the site would need to be tier classified. So if it's been closed out and, and just the RAM or new RAM is being done, but it hasn't been tier classified, then that would not um, qualify. Okay, so it's the current tier classification. I need to look because there's multiple. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question that says, um, I think that just answered a question on the presentation. This recorded version and the presentation will be posted on the tag webpage shortly. So I would keep checking back the tag webpage over the course of the next few days to, to a week. Um, there's a, another related question of whether we can download a copy of the uh, slide presentation and that it so in addition to the the uh, recording of the presentation, it will also be available as a download. Um, Peggy and Nancy, I think you may have already answered Andrew's question. Does the contract have to end on end in June 2023 or June 2024? Um, June 2024, um, it has to end by. Um, of course, if the if if the project is finished before that, you can end the contract before that. But we're allowing through um, June 30th, 2024, to to finish the projects. Mm -hmm. I think MassDP, we do reserve the right to extend a contract, right? but that is at our sole discretion. Right. Yeah, and part of um, allowing more time, as I said, um, you know, for these contracts to extend into the next fiscal year is um, the hope that the, um, you know, that the need for extensions will, um, will be eliminated. But we will consider them, of course, if necessary and appropriate. There's a, an additional question from Deborah. Does a member of the PIP have to submit the application or can anyone who is affected by a contamination site? Um, anybody who's, um, any group who's eligible who is an eligible um, person um, who is eligible to apply can apply. It does not have to be a PIP group. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but. Okay, great. If you want at this point, I can stop sharing and if people have additional questions, they could. Uh, I think you have the ability to um, unmic yourself, mic yourself. So. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, looks like we can wrap up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but thank you, Peggy and Nancy. And thanks everyone for joining tonight. And um, as Peggy and Nancy said, 
uh, please reach out to them if you have questions. Okay. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.